All right, so we are going to continue here. We're going to look at some algebraic examples of concavity and inflection points. Um, last time we kind of developed the concepts and looked at some graphical examples. So we're going to start with a um, f of x function equal to x plus sine of x on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. And first thing I'm always saying throughout any of the, the um, increasing, decreasing, concavity, any of these problems that we're doing, it is really useful to identify any restricted domains before you get started. So try to get into that habit. We don't have any here. Um, x is defined everywhere. Sine of x is defined for all real numbers. So um, we're defined everywhere, just something to kind of point out and recognize. All right, so um, our test for concavity and to find inflection points is right up here. It's going to feel really similar to what we did for increasing, decreasing, and extrema. The difference is we're doing it on the second derivative. So we need to get to the second derivative. And so if we have, of course, f is equal to x plus sine of x, then f prime is going to be 1 plus cosine of x. And then that's what we would use to find increasing, decreasing, and extrema. But we go on to the second derivative, which is minus sine x, in order to find concavity and potential inflection points. So we are looking for where our second derivative is equal to 0, or of course, in general, where the second derivative does not exist. Um, you know, but in this case, we don't have anything to worry about there. All right, so continuing, we're really just looking for where dividing by the negative for where sine of x is equal to 0. And so when we think about that, on our interval from 0 to 2 pi, that's just going to be 0, pi, and 2 pi. And 0 and 2 pi were kind of the, the endpoints of our interval anyway, so really pi is the only one in that interval. All right, and so what do we do next? We do this really similar test that we did um, before, but this time we are doing it on the second derivative. So we are plugging into the second derivative. Again, I like the labeling. I think it's helpful. I want you to do that. And then we'll still make conclusions about the original. All right, so we're just on the interval from 0 to 2 pi, regardless of whether or not those would have come out as where the second derivative was equal to 0. Those are just the the endpoints of our interval. In fact, maybe I'll even do this. Let's just kind of put the brackets there. It kind of indicates that. And then we also have where the second derivative was equal to 0 was at pi. All right, so we are subbing in values in this interval. So maybe we sub in, um, I don't know, let's say we sub in between 0 and pi. Probably pi over 2 would be our favorite value here. So we're subbing in pi over 2, and again, we're subbing it into our second derivative. And our second derivative up here, well, that was just the opposite of sine x. So that's our second derivative. And so if we were to sub in sine at pi over 2, well, that's positive, that's 1, but then the negative in front means that we are going to be negative here. And so where the second derivative is negative, that means the original function is concave down. Now let's say we sub in a value between pi and 2 pi. So maybe, probably the nicest one, 3 pi over 2. Well, sine at 3 pi over 2 would be a negative 1, but we have the minus in front of that, so that's going to take us back to a positive. And where the second derivative is positive, that's going to mean that the original function is concave up. And so... What we now know also is that x equals pi, we do have an inflection point. So let's just pull all this together and kind of write out our final answer here. So we are going to be concave down on the interval from 0 to pi. We are going to be concave up on our interval from pi to 2 pi. And then we are going to have an inflection point, in this case, just one inflection point in this interval, of course. And that is at x equals pi. And then remember, it's always subbing back into the original function. So it would be the f of pi 
which would be pi plus sine at pi, and your sine at pi um, is equal to zero. So this is kind of goofy looking because we're going to have pi pi. <laughs> Um, but hopefully that all kind of makes sense here, right? So then the pi plus zero, we end up back at pi. Um, so those are all of our final conclusions there. All right, so let's take a look at another example that is a little bit more um, maybe algebraically challenging, potentially involved. Involves a better word than challenging. All right, let's take a look at g of x equals x squared plus 3 all over x. All right, so again, I'm a big fan of before we ever get started, when you have a restricted domain, observing that. So the domain here is everything except for 0. The denominator goes to 0 at x equals 0. It doesn't make the numerator 0, so that means it's a vertical asymptote. So just kind of observe that. I think the book really starts to emphasize this a little bit more in the next section that we're going to cover, but there's no reason to not start to make those observations right away. Okay, we have a couple of choices. Um, I'll be honest, if it was me, I would probably myself I would probably rewrite this function, the original function, as x squared over x plus 3 over x, and then take the derivative term by term. So this is probably how I would do it, um, but you don't have to do it that way. You could have left it like it was and done quotient rule, um, but I am going to do it this way. I think this is a little, little quicker. So let's go ahead and find g prime. So derivative of x is 1, and then with power rule, minus 3x to the negative second. And remember here, we're talking about concavity and inflection, so we're going on to the second derivative. So 6x to the negative third. So my second derivative is 6 over x to the third. I would rewrite that as 6 over x to the third. If you were working with quotient rule and simplifying, you'd already kind of be in that form. So this is our second derivative here. All right, so we are looking for places where our second derivative is equal to 0 or where our second derivative does not exist. Now, we have the second derivative as a simplified fraction. So where it's equal to 0 would be where its numerator goes to 0. But that's just 6. And pretty clearly, 6 can't ever equal 0. There's no variable there. So we don't get anything from where the numerator is 0. We do, however, have a denominator, x to the third, that can go to 0, if you think of taking the cube root or something like that. But that would be at x equals 0. Now, technically, by definition, this is not a critical point. So let's just note something here. So let's note that technically, and if you're working on a problem that's asking you to identify critical points, um, well, actually, I'm kind of misspeaking. Uh, critical points are technically where the first derivative goes to zero. We're at the second derivative. So this is like the critical point of the first derivative. Um, so when we talk about so technically, let's write it this way. x equals 0 is a, we've already identified it up above, is a vertical asymptote. And thus, it can't ever be an inflection point because it's not even a point on the function, just like it couldn't be an extrema because it's not a point on the function. So let's just kind of observe that. But we do want to include it in the sign analysis. So this is key. Um, we do include in our sign analysis. Now, you may be wondering why. Like, why would we do it if I'm already um, aware that this can't be an inflection point? Well, the reason is we're also looking for intervals of concavity. 
And when you think about um, looking for inflection points, um, you're also at the same time looking for places where a function might change concavity. So this is not our function here, but think about a vertical asymptote, let's say at x equals 1. That might be a, a case where the function might change a location from concave up into concave down. So vertical asymptotes, even though they can't ever be inflection points, additionally, they can't be extrema, we do include them, we do include in our sign analysis. What I like to do with these in my sign analysis is just give myself a little reminder here that at x equals zero, um, I might in parentheses write underneath of it just like a little VA to remind myself it's a vertical asymptote. All right, enough kind of talk on that. Let's get into our sine analysis, subbing into our second derivative to make conclusion about the concavity. All right, so let's sub in something less than zero. So let's say I sub in negative one. We're subbing into 6 over x cubed. Of course, 6 is always positive. Negative 1 cubed is negative, so we are negative. And then if we sub in something bigger than 0, let's say we sub in 1, 6 is positive, divided by 1 cubed is positive, we are positive. All right, so we are concave down from negative infinity to 0. And then the second derivative is positive, so that means the original function is concave up from 0 to infinity. So this is a really good kind of time to observe why, kind of like my little example I was sketching out before, why do we include vertical asymptotes when we do sign analysis? Here's a perfect example of why, because they are still really important locations on graphs where concavity, also increasing, decreasing behavior can also change. Um, so you would include them if you were doing sign analysis on your first derivative as well. Um, and I just wrote this backwards. Um, so we are concave down. This happens when you're trying to talk while I'm writing. Um, so I'm concave down, pardon me, from negative infinity to zero. And then I was concave up concave up from 0 to infinity. And let's just kind of write out that there are no inflection points. So you have to actually be a point on the function to be an inflection point. So in this case, concavity changes at a vertical asymptote. All right. so. Um, let's go ahead and end um, this video here. Um, next time we're going to come back and talk about something. Um, I have one more example of a graph. We'll kind of pull all this together. And then we're also going to talk about the second derivative test. You know what? Actually, let's wrap up this graphical example. Um, and then the next video we'll start with second derivative test. So this is a nice kind of wrap it all up example. So suppose we were given all of this information and we have to come up with a sketch of the function that satisfies all of this criteria. So first we are told that f of 0 equals 1 and f of 2 equals 0. So what is this telling me? This is telling me that the point 0, 1 and the point 2, 0 are on the function. So whatever I do, I better draw a graph that goes through those two points. Now, the next two facts, pay attention, it's not f of, it's f prime of. So this is now telling me f prime at negative 2 and f prime at 0 are both 0. So this is telling me that at x equals negative 2 and at x equals 0, there is a horizontal tangent line. So the slope of the tangent line is equal to 0. So writing it out just in a little different way, there is a horizontal tangent line at negative 2 and 0. So that'll be something we'll want to be kind of mindful of 
Um, yeah, I could even maybe kind of just lightly draw in something to indicate a horizontal tangent line right there at x equals 0. At x equals negative 2, I don't know where that's going to end up, so I'm not going to draw in anything there. All right, now where f prime is greater than 0, so I want you to kind of think about that from your first derivative means that f is increasing. And where f prime is less than 0, that is where f is decreasing. So let's pull these two facts together since they both involve the first derivative. And think about this in a way, that should have been a comma, um, right there. Let's think about this in a way that maybe looks a little more familiar to you. So if you think about we're changing behavior around negative 2 and 0, and if we think about what's happening, f prime is um, greater than 0 from negative infinity to negative 2, so we're positive. And then in the next two intervals, f prime is negative. And so that tells me that on f, we are increasing and then we change to decreasing. So when you think about um, what you have here, this f prime greater than zero, so this is telling me that f is increasing, and then where f prime is less than zero, that is telling me that f is decreasing. All right, I suppose I don't need to write that twice. I have that written off to the side with my sign analysis. And then the last two facts, are all about, again, that should be a comma there. So these last two facts, these are about the second derivative. So let's think about what this is telling me. It's telling me information about the second derivative. So think about what we typically do on our sign analysis. And we have some behavior that's changing at a couple of different points at negative one and at zero. So from negative infinity to negative one, the second derivative is negative. And that is going to tell me that the original function would be concave down. And then between negative 1 and 0, the second derivative is positive. That will tell me the original function is concave up. And then from 0 to infinity, the second derivative is less than 0, so it's negative. So we are back to concave down. So this is a lot of information to kind of pull together here, and we have to come up with the sketch on the graph. So let's just kind of shorthand a couple of things here. So I am supposed to be increasing from negative infinity to negative 2. So everywhere from here to here, I am supposed to be increasing. And then from negative 2 to 0, and then from 0 to infinity, so basically, after that, I'm supposed to be decreasing. Now, I could maybe do that relatively well and have a horizontal tangency at x equals 0. If I just did something like here, I'm increasing um, horizontal tangency and then kind of decreasing. I should have went through that point. But then I'm not going to get the concavity changes that I also need to reflect. So that won't be enough to do it. All right, so what are the concavity changes? Let's just kind of shorthand those down below the graph. So my second derivative is going to be negative. So I'm concave down from negative infinity to negative 1. So all the way over to here, I'm concave down from negative 1 to 0. So just between those two values, I'm supposed to be concave up. And then from 0 to infinity, I'm supposed to be concave down again. All right, so let's give this a whirl, keeping in mind horizontal tangency at negative 2. And it looks like since we're changing from increasing to decreasing um, at x equals negative 2, this is now, we can safely say, this is going to be a local max. And obviously, we're going to have then at x equals negative 1, we're going to have an inflection point. And at x equals 0, we are also going to have an inflection point. All right, so let's give this a whirl. So I need to be increasing and concave down to negative 2. Okay, so that looks pretty good. So I'm increasing and concave down from negative 2. I then need to go decreasing and stay concave down 
um, to negative one, so maybe about here. Then I need to kind of subtly change and stay decreasing, but then change it to concave up in between negative one and zero. And that looks concave up. And then I wanna go back to concave down and stay decreasing. And I kind of missed my marker there, so let's try that again. Um, because, oops. Um, because I have to, well, geez, I keep hitting something. My sincerest apologies. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let me get back to that graph. Okay, <laughs> let's try this again. Okay, so I am going to, I kind of missed that point, but this is the basic shape. Okay, this is definitely going to be, um, I just have to hit that point a little better. Um, so I'm going to be decreasing. Why does this keep doing this to me? It doesn't like me today, or I am touching something I don't realize I am. Um, okay, so decreasing and concave down. Yikes. All right, so we are going to, I kind of lost a little bit of my concave down shape there at the end. Let's erase that just a bit. All right, so here is my graph. So I start off increasing but concave up. I get to a point of horizontal tangency. <laughs> this is not my day. This is a good sign that it is time to end this video. Um, so there is my max that is occurring at x equals negative 2. Here is my inflection point at x equals negative 1 and also at x equals 0. So some subtle changes in the shape of that graph. All right, before I mess it up again, we will stop here. And then when we come back next time, we'll have the last topic to look at in this rather lengthy section, um, something called the second derivative test we'll take a look at next time.